Welcome, everybody. We're very, very glad that you're here with us. And as you can see on the screen, thank you. We thank you for being here. But um, we really wanted to say thank you to everyone who has supported us and helped us move the program along since our last webinar. Our, when we had our first webinar in September, we um, that was the first time we had gathered a group together to talk about the RP Group One program and our gene therapy. Um, treatment. And since then, we have expanded the people on the RP Group 1 list that we have, as well as raised over $114,000 for the RP Group 1 program. And we truly couldn't have done it without you. So we wanted to say, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for being here today, but then thank you for all the that you have done in the last few months. And we're excited about what's going to happen in 2022. Thanks, Heather. So Heather, if you can continue to run the slides for me, that'd be wonderful. I will, there. All right, great. All right, thank you again, everyone, for joining. We have uh, 20 participants now, I think, registered. How many did we have in the end, Heather? 39. 39. Um, so feel free to share information about this webinar. We will be posting it on YouTube, similar to last time. So um, if someone's not able to attend today, but wants to find out more, they can find that link through our website, um, or you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube and stay up to date on our newest posts. All right, so today we wanted to cover our milestones met in 2021. This is a big year for us, uh, really hitting the ground running with, with the RP Group 1 program. We also want to talk about next steps, uh, specifically focusing on 2022 and touching on later years um, and look at the timelines and expectations around those. And then have a conversation with the community to let you know about the resources that we're looking to tap into to reach those benchmarks. Oh, go ahead, Heather. So I wanna make sure for, for those of you who haven't uh, joined us previously, I just want to orient you to Odelia because we aren't your run of the mill biotech or nonprofit. We really are a combination of those things and hold that at the heart of everything we do. So we consider ourselves a nonprofit biotech. We were founded in 2017. Uh, you know, with everything COVID, things have been challenging, but we really do think we're we're, we have a great program in RP Group One. Um, this is our lead program. We do have other programs in our portfolio. Um, if you ever have questions about those, we're happy to answer them or bring them up on a future webinar. But this is, uh, our RP Group One program is our flagship program and we're really excited to see the progress we've been able to make uh, moving it forward. And I'll touch on those timelines in a minute. Uh, so the mission of Odelia is to utilize a unique nonprofit business model to accelerate the development of gene therapies for people with rare disease. Uh, we hope to change the way treatments are brought from the lab to the clinic. And we really do fundamentally believe that the science is there to move these programs forward and it shouldn't be about the prevalence of the disease or the commercial interest. So we're trying to find innovative ways to move these programs forward, but each might look a little bit different in those opportunities. Go ahead, Heather. So our vision for a new paradigm is treatments for rare disease can be found. I touched on this, that we have the science and the know-how for many of these diseases. Um, we have had successes with gene therapy in the clinic and with commercialization of those therapeutics. So we do think it's time to take advantage and leverage those successes into uh, some of the, the more traditionally challenging areas. And it's not because rare diseases are challenging in and of themselves. It's really that commercial model that much of drug development leans on. So we really try to focus on building a path forward. Um, and it was some of the roadblocks that even the RP Group One program has come up against, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways uh, through novel partnerships, through innovative um, thinking and, and through st strategic planning to move the program forward despite those obstacles that have arisen. So we want to go ahead and move forward. I want to put this in the framework really if, for the audience to make sure that we understand where we are in the process. Uh, there, you may have seen very similar diagrams of the drug development process. Uh, oftentimes those go all the way through commercial approval. Right now what I'm showing you is a snapshot of everything from very early basic research um, and discovery 
through to that clinical portion. So we're looking at the first, I would say, half of a drug pipeline process. Um, and that's where we are. We're in the late stages of this process. Uh, so normally you start that process with identifying the disease and then the gene or the causative event or the pathobiology of the disease. Having a better understanding of that lets us develop the right therapeutic for that disorder. In the context of gene therapy, we then look at the available therapeutics. Um, there's many different kinds besides gene therapy. Uh, there's small molecules, which have been your traditional approaches in pharma and biotech up until the past decade, where gene therapy, CRISPR, um, RNA therapeutic approaches have become more popular. So in this context, we're talking about gene therapy. Um, once we have an understanding of that a gene therapy might work, and that's by usually putting the gene therapy into a, a disease model and showing it's able to recover function, we then have what's called a proof of concept. And that's really where Delia gets interested in a program is once you have a proof of concept in a disease model, we think it's the right time to say the science has proven that there's a path forward. And then it becomes a very strategic consideration of how do we move that program forward. So then you enter into early preclinical development and there we start to establish a strategic and operational plan for each program. We work on really proving that a gene therapy approach is robustly effective in that disorder. And then late stage preclinical development, which is really where our P group one is today, is proving that we've moved from that it's, it's efficacious, but we also need to prove that it's safe and able to move into clinical trials. That's also when we start doing work on clinical trial development. We assemble a clinical advisory group to help inform the best path to move forward. And then we start to enter what we call the regulatory environment. Many of you will be familiar with the FDA or the EMA in Europe. That's where we start those early conversations about how best to proceed. Okay, Heather. So to give you an overview of where the program has been and where we are today, I wanted to just step back pre-2017, pre-Odelia, there had been quite a bit of work on our grip one and understanding its role in mutations and vision loss, establishing animal models for our RP group one associated disorders. So it's not just LCA6, but CORD13 in forms of juvenile retinitis pigmentosa, but part of the ability to move these programs forward into a therapeutic evaluation was really being able to, was really enabled by having animal models that could be effectively used to test if these therapies could work. So we, we really like to lean on the work of Lupin and Berg and Eric Pierce in their labs, which was foundational for our program today. And they established much of the early work in proving out that, that early efficacy data. So showing there was a proof of concept that putting back our group one into these animal models would have an effect on stabilizing or recovery of function. So in 2017, through the found, founding of Odelia in a partnership with Luke Vandenberg and our CEO, Scott Dorfman, who comes from the patient advocacy side and business world, that is where Odelia formally took on the RP Group 1 program from Vandenberg and Pierce Labs in 2017. And in 2019, um, many of you may know, we did outlicense that program to a biotech partner uh, who invested heavily in that program for the first year progress the science in a very robust way. So actually it was really exciting to see that foundational work prove out in a more formal drug development setting. But unfortunately the program for many reasons, um, potentially primarily business reasons came back to Odelia in 2021. Um, and since then we've really been working hard to move forward a development plan that is going to strategically tackle some of the obstacles we see in rare disease. So before I go into the slide, Heather, do you want to go to the next slide? Because this really focuses on where we've been in 2021. So in putting together this strategic plan, we started to put in motion not just the 
establishment of, of the efficacy data, which is really important, the safety data, which is really important. But we've also put in motion the clinical development work that is needed to move the program forward, as well as that engagement with the regulatory environment. So in 2021, we did receive from the FDA orphan drug and rare pediatric disease designations for the program, which is really exciting. This, it not only establishes that the recognition from the regulatory environment of the program, its potential and where it is currently in its development process, it also sets us up for success further down the road. There are discounts that we can potentially tap into or grants um, or other financial benefits that we would be taking advantage of. And that's, that's really important for uh, rare disease programs. We also assembled a clinical advisory board and that work has begun as of July of last year. We've met a few times, continue to work with that group. If you want to know more about that, we do have the group listed on our website. And so far the conversations have actually been really exciting to see what the thinking is in the field. Cause I think some of that has changed in the past even two years. We have developed a full development plan and budget for the program, taking it from where it is today through to clinical trials. So into that, what we call an IND submission. So once the preclinical work is finished, we've shown it's effective in animals, or the disease model, we've shown it's safe. Then we go to, in this case, most likely the FDA and have a conversation about opening a clinical trial and that's through an IND submission. So we have a full development plan and budget established around the program to strategically take that forward. We're right now working with partners to secure our manufacturing process, as well as actually our toxin biodistribution studies. And those are our, the, what I, when I refer to safety studies, that would refer generally to toxicity and biodistribution studies, which are critically important for moving a gene therapy forward. And then Heather's gonna speak a little bit more today about fundraising for the RP Group One project um, and our strategy of how we're gonna work, hopefully in leverage the resources in the community, but also those um, in a broader network. So I wanted to visit the timelines in a little bit more detail. What you will see on the left-hand side, there's five different categories um, that map out into some of the areas I spoke about, preclinical safety testing, vector manufacturing, regulatory engagement, so with FDA or an EMA, clinical development, and then financial resources really runs across the bottom with our expectations mapping onto that timeline. Drug development is often a, a shifting landscape where you're trying to get ahead of the next activity, but line up a lot of parallel uh, ongoing activities. So we're, whenever we have conversations with the community, we like to put up these timelines, but they will likely shift. It's just the nature of the, of the work that we do. So we're trying to strategically plan to go as fast as we can, but we also need to establish resourcing, uh, both as far as funding and execution resources, as far as like vendors or service providers ahead of those needs. Um, so in the next year, in 2022, what we really hope to focus on maybe Heather, you can point this out on the slide while I speak through it, um, would be vector manufacturing. So preparing, and there's some jargon on this slide, but I'll, I'll try to make this a bit more accessible. Um, the, the, the tox or GLP tox materials are our first focus because this allows us to create what is basically our precursor to our clinical gene therapy vector. Um, and that will be used in our safety studies, which Heather, if you can point those out in green um, at the beginning of 2023, the toxin biodistribution study. So that material has to be made in order to use it in that tox and safety study. And then we will later in 2023 move into what we call clinical manufacturing, which um, there's off, often the phrase uh, or acronym GMP. You'll hear around that. It's a different standard of manufacturing that gets used once you move into the clinic. We also be working on assay development, which supports these activities to prove um, the quality 
and, and set up control systems to ensure that the vector being made is the same every time it's effective, it's expected to be safe and happy to, if, if we want in future webinars or in one-on-one um, -on -one discussions, if anyone has questions about a bit more about the detail in this process, we can, we can discuss that. And then you'll see in gray, you can point those out. These are some of the milestones we're hoping to initiate around the regulatory environment. So there's two key points in the next, I would say year, year and a half. We're going to have a pre-IND meeting, which just means a precursor discussion with the FDA to really map out our plan for the program in the final stages and get their feedback on that proposal. And then we would be moving into the IND submission at the beginning of 2024. We'll be continuing work with our, our uh, clinical advisory group in blue. And a lot of that is actually setting us up for success by having a clear clinical trial plan very early in that pre-IND meeting so we can get feedback and we can adjust our plans as needed. And with that, Heather, I think it's maybe time to turn it over to you. You want to jump in? Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Hello. Um, sorry. There. Um, anything else on the top you want to go over? Um, I think we covered most of it. The other thing is we could do a time check. We, we could briefly pause to see if there's any questions before we move into your portion. Um, if not, we can go ahead and jump in. And feel free I think that can come under the Q&A section or Catherine or Felicia, let us know if there's anything coming in over the chat. Okay, why don't we, why don't you go ahead and get started and okay. feel free if anyone wants to put questions in while Heather's speaking, we can come back to them at the end. Okay, um, well, hello again, I'm Heather Green. I'm the Director of Development for Odelia and development meaning fundraising and um, resource development, not science program development. Um, and I think the what's exciting is how much we've been able to accomplish in the last year um, and how much we, I, I think we can do in the coming year or two. So um, as many of you know, Odelia is a very small organization staff-wise. So we do rely on volunteers to help us reach our mission. And that's a lot of what I wanna talk about today and how we can leverage our networks um, to, to get more people kind of in the fold to help us expand our the awareness and the resources that we, can, we have in order to reach the goals for the program. So, <clears throat> The, I, I, to put it in perspective, there's an estimated 400 to 600 people in the United States and 20,000 worldwide that um, have the RP group one mutation, but there are, there were only 39 people registered for our call, which means that there are a lot of people who either um, don't know about what we're doing or don't have um, the, des the, their designate or, sorry losing my words, um, don't yet know uh, that they have the RP group one mutation. And so we need to let more people know what we're doing. Um, and, and that is just sharing it through our networks, all kinds of networks, social media, um, just even chatting with people that we know, but we really want to expand that our awareness about what we're doing as much as we can in the next year to two. Every time I talk with somebody about Odelia, it, our mission and what we're doing resonates with people because they understand, especially after the last couple of years, people, the general public understands a lot more about the process to get treatments to patients. And so they, under, it, it, they understand what we're trying to do to get things, um, to get the treatments to the patients and out of the labs. So we just need to tell more people. And I think that we could really um, generate 
uh, momentum forward to reach our goals. So what can, what are we asking y'all to do? To share via your social media networks and um, emailing or uh, through if you do, if, if you're involved in civic groups and or other volunteer organizations, things like that, just let people know. Um, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how some of the resources we're, we're gonna provide to help make that happen. So <clears throat> the process for gene therapy is very long and involved and um, also very expensive as we all know. And we're to the final stages of preclinical work for the RP Grip one gene therapy program. And the, uh, we need to raise a good bit of money in the next couple of years in order to, to manufacture the vector and to run the studies that we need to get to that IND that Ashley talked about. And it seems like a big number, but I really feel like we can make it taking small chunks at a time. And this is a general outline of what I think we can do to get there. Odelia is doing a lot to um, reach out to foundations and companies. And we, if, if we can expand that network, as I talked about, both in awareness and in fundraising, I truly believe that we can get there. You'll notice on the screen, the green lines are pretty good estimates of what I think we can do. And then there's the catch all of other. And that might be a daunting um, number, but what we've seen is the more we talk about what we're doing, things fall into place and we can get there. So we might not know exactly where all the funding is going to come from, but we really believe that we can make that happen. So um, we're gonna move on. I think it's really important to understand uh, where funding does come from. And this is a chart from Giving USA. And they run this, um, they gather these statistics every single year. And this is from 2021 and it's based on giving in 2020. And you can see that 69%, the vast majority of funds for, for charities, for nonprofits in the United States comes from individual people. These are not, while we do have the Bill Gates and the um, Mackenzie Scotts of the world included in this number, these are the um, everyday people who give money throughout the year to things that they care about. And there's also a statistic that 12% of the population in the United States strongly supports medical research and uh, for um, healthcare advancements. So that's a large part of the population in the United States and they're the ones who are giving to organizations like us. But it's also important to remember that even though foundations and corporations are a small percentage of the, the whole pie, they're still giving away billions with a B and billions of dollars. So we are gonna approach all of these different sources to help support the RP Grip One program. Um, but the biggest chunk of the pie does come from individuals and that's where we are hoping to focus a lot of our efforts, the efforts of volunteers and try to get more people involved. So I think it's important to know that Odelia has been communicating or, or submitting proposals to foundations and we will continue to do that. We do that regularly. Um, for example, we submitted a grant to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. They have a program called the, um, I wanna make sure it's called the TRAP program, the Translational Research Acceleration Program. So we hope that we will hear from them in March about that. We've submitted proposals to PCORI and some other large foundations, but there are more out there. Um, and there are some that aren't necessarily um, on our radar. So if you know of someone, if you've heard of another rare disease group that's gotten a grant, or you know someone who is uh, part of a foundation, if you wanna let us know, that also would be very helpful. Um, personal connections do increase the likelihood of success with foundations, so an introduction. And, and it even if it's not an introduction, if you just shoot me an email and ask me if I've thought about this one or that one, that would be a big help as well. We also are doing the same thing with companies. As I mentioned before, it's a small percentage, but it's still almost $17 billion that they gave away in 2020. So there is um, 
uh, room to, to get support from, from corporations. A couple of things that I want to point out that have happened since September, since our last webinar. After that webinar, we had someone who attended who uh, suggested that we get approved by a matching gift company called Benevity, and they run matching gift programs for companies all over the country, hundreds of companies. So if you work for a particular company and you make a gift, your company will match it one-to-one -one or two-to-one or something like that. We did not, we weren't registered with Benevity and we, we um, filled out the application and we created the RP Group One project on their website. And since that time, we've gotten almost $3,000 in matching gifts. And we never would have been able to do that if one of the folks who was on the webinar didn't send me an email and say, have you thought about this? So it, we will follow up with um, the suggestions, all of them. And we really, I can't tell you how much we appreciate those. And I welcome you to submit an email or, or just call me. Um, with any ideas that you have, because it really does make a difference. So if you, if your company does matching gifts, um, or you, please consider um, submitting your gift for a match. And then also, if there are other employees in your company who might want to make a contribution but aren't sure uh, of a place to do it, certainly you can recommend Odelia. And then if there are companies who you work for or who you know of who might be willing to support us again, if you just want to mention that to us, um, we, would be well, we would be glad to follow up with them and submit a proposal to them as well. And since the last webinar, based on some suggestions, we also signed up for a service that uh, helps us accept cryptocurrency and uh, stocks. So it's a free service to Odelia and they will take those donations and convert them to money and give us the money from that. So it's not that we're, um, we're certainly not in the cryptocurrency business, but we, we have found a way to be able to accept donations of that. And we actually did get a small cryptocurrency donation, but one will lead to more. So we were kind of excited about that. And we appreciate, like I said, we appreciate all of those suggestions. So many uh, rare disease groups do activities to raise money. So it isn't just um, individuals donating, but it's actually fundraising events that they come together to organize and raise money. These are just some ideas. Um, it was suggest suggested after the last webinar that we maybe can help provide some ideas and some support. So these are things to think about if it happens in your community or if one of these resonates with you to try to organize. The top one, an example here in the um, town where I live, there's a big parkway, divided highway. And once a year they close that down and they run a road race on it. And it's a big community event, but they also choose a different beneficiary every single year. So the community comes out for the race because it's really, it's a great time. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it supports a different group every year. And there might be something like that in your community. And if you know about one of those and want to help get us that information and we can work together to ask them if they'll support Odelia and the RP Group One project, that's a great way to leverage something that's already happening that could help move help us re reach our fundraising goal as well. But there's a, lots of other things. If you know a, a restaurant owner or a store owner who might want to do a roundup campaign or a restaurant night, there's the, you know, uh, tip a, you help serve and they provide an extra tip. They call it tip a cop a lot. Um, they do that here when, with um, law enforcement officers, but you could do that in all different kinds of settings. So some of these are bigger events, some of them are smaller events, but if something like this it interests you or you know of a way to make that happen, we will provide um, some tip sheets, I guess, some event overview sheets. And I'm happy to answer questions. I've been doing special event fundraising for a long, long time. So if you have some questions or need some ideas, I'm happy to get on the phone and, and help talk y'all through that. The peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and raising awareness is how things um, happen and have always happened with philanthropy in the United States and beyond. I mean, that's, that's kind of how philanthropy started. And so we're wondering, we're asking if, if there are little things that people can do, not everybody can do a big event, which is fine because um, if 
you tell two people and they tell two people, it really does help us expand our network and increase the resources. So a couple of things to ask yourself. Do you know 10 people that you could send an email to, to tell them about Odelia or to ask them to consider supporting what we're doing? Um, we have a function on our or we will at the end of February, a function on the end of, on our website that you can set up a team page and you can, uh, we've all seen these where people participate in walkathons or runs or um, bicycle rides and they ask their friends to support them. And so we will have that functionality on our site. So would you set one of those up and send that out to people that you might know? Do you have a, uh, a civic group in your community that allows people to come in and talk and would you be willing to go and present a little bit on Odelia? And we could certainly provide you with the information and a slide deck uh, to talk about the RP Group One project and some of the things that we're trying to do. So there's lots of different ideas of things um, that can help us leverage our network to grow and increase our resources. And last, we, we've thought about um, creating some kind of signature event for Odelia. And I say that meaning just something that can be replicated around the country, around the world and different communities. It might be a dinner, it might be a run, it might be um, a letter writing campaign. There's lots of different things that we could do, but we are hoping we might be able to find some folks who wanna to volunteer to to come together to brainstorm what that might be and help coordinate it for the first time, provide kind of an outline, timeline, direction sheet, if you will, for others in other communities. So if that's something that you might be interested in doing, we would um, love to have you join our committee to do that. And you can see my email on the web, on the screen, it's hgreen at odelia.org. Just shoot me an email and uh, anything. Even if you, you're not sure, we can certainly talk through it and see if it's something that would fit your time or, or if there might be something else that you can do. Um, we need, we're hoping to get volunteers who might have a PR background who could help us create different uh, pieces to send out or to post on a, a resource page that volunteers can use like a one pager or different graphics or press releases, things like that. So if you have a PR background or you know someone, we could certainly use volunteers for that. There's lots and lots of opportunities. And the biggest call to action we have for today is if you know someone or you have time to volunteer in some capacity, please let us know because we have uh, lots of things that we believe we can do to reach our goal. And the analogy is to me is it's a it's a steep road, but it's a clear road. We know where we need to get to and how to get there. We just need to raise a lot of financial resources to get to the to the end. So we're hoping that we have some volunteers today that might be willing to help us out. So this is sort of the summary. Where do you start? If you want to volunteer or if you have some thoughts or suggestions, at the end of the month, we'll be adding a page. We're building out a page and it will be continuously evolving. That's going to have some resources for y'all to use. Um, like I said, one pagers, different graphics, uh, hopefully a, a video at some point um, down the road that people can use to share social media or um, other places, other, you know, other networks that you have to help us reach more people. Because we feel like the it will all fall into place. We just need to continue to expand the awareness about what we're doing in order to reach, to reach that goal of getting to clinical trials. And I think that's it. So if there are any questions. Thanks, Heather. I'm also joining back. I think there was, uh, there's been a few questions through the Q&A function, uh, just to give you an idea of how those work while, um, if you're considering submitting something. So there's a raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I think that should allow participants to raise your hand and we can then unmute you if you do wanna speak directly um, on, on screen or to the audience. Uh, there's a Q&A that goes directly to the hosts and panelists, and then there's the chat function, which I think can go to the general group. 
So with that, one of the questions was how many staff at Odelia? We're a, we're a focused small team. We have, if it, it depends how you count, we have quite a few volunteers that we work with and consultants. Um, so for staff, uh, when we look at staff member, member, some of those are volunteer positions from folks who've, who've been in the field. Um, we have, I would say then five or six staff members. Um, some of those are part-time consultants and contractors and part-time volunteer, because we do often get folks who are just drawn to the mission, who have worked in biotech or pharma in the past or research and want to contribute. Um, we also, I would say at any one time, we have probably nine to 12 different volunteers that offer different expertise. Um, some of those are directly from the, the disease communities we work with. Um, sometimes they're, they're parents or patients themselves that have a unique capability like a data scientist or website design or, um, or someone who's not directly to, tied to that community, but has maybe they're a consultant that works with biotech and pharma and just are really drawn to the mission. We have, we have somebody in the health economics area that's allowed us to do a market analysis comparing opportunities to Luxterna. Um, and that was a, a wonderful asset in trying to better understand the landscape, the, the commercial landscape for our pre-group one. Um, so we there's a gamut of, of expertise that gets lended to Odelia. Sometimes that's project specific. Sometimes it is an ongoing relationship. Um, and we, we've been able to leverage that in really unique and wonderful ways. Um, I would just comment also, because this kind of leads into oftentimes the question around, do we have lab space? So as a nonprofit, we decided very early on to really invest in strategic partnerships and leverage our nonprofit status to operate virtually. So we really, the, the core of Odelia's function is to think through the scientific landscape and opportunities. Um, and to develop strategic partnerships that leverage our, our status as a nonprofit and that mission into unique partnerships. But we, we utilize and we feel like we can move a lot faster by utilizing the expertise that's already established out there. And that's through partnerships that might be academics um, or experts with a disease or an approach, a specific uh, disease model potentially or it's working through uh, contract research organizations, service providers, contract uh, manufacturing organizations where we can formulate a, a unique long-term partnership that mutually benefits both parties. Um, and and you know, we hope that that grows into something that can also benefit other nonprofits over time. All right, any other questions? There's one about Rare Disease Day, which is, um, yes, it is at the end of the month. It's February 28th. And our goal is uh, to have some of these resources that we've mentioned out onto the website and by that day so that we can sort of launch from Rare Disease Day and run a campaign like we did the end of the year campaign through um, the next couple months. So we don't have, we, we're, we will certainly post about Rare Disease Day because it's an important day for the community, um, but our fundraising campaign will, will launch on that day. And something that I think is very important is that the end of year campaign that Odelia did, the 114,000 plus dollars that we raised enabled us to get to where we are this year and to really start moving the manufacturing forward. So it's, a, it, it's, it was a very important part to jumpstart what we're gonna be able to do in 2022. So it, it really was a huge, um, it was a huge deal that we were able to make, to do that at the end of 2021. Yeah, I think that's an important point to stress even a little bit further that really, it, as you can see from the timelines, that piece of work, that starting and initiating that manufacturing piece really becomes key for all the events that we're putting in motion downstream. So being, being able to raise those funds and we have also um, commitment and buy-in from Odelia's board behind that plan, which we, we, we pitched and to the board la end of last year, they were really excited about that plan. Um, being able to financially support that, support that 
that even that one piece really puts a lot of other things in a forward movement. Um, so we're excited about that. And there's a question on the chat. For fundraising purposes, how do we pitch what the gene therapy will do? A preservation of site, a cure, an improvement to site? It depends if you ask Heather or I. Fundraising folks love the word cure. Scientists are allergic to it, um, I'll be honest. So my background's from the science side. Um, no, but we, what I would say we are excited about is um, from a conservative scientific viewpoint, I've worked in the gene therapy space for a number of years with probably 20 or 30 different rare disease programs. We often talk about stabilization at, at, at the base level. So stabilizing what function is there at the point that you administer gene therapy. That would be our baseline goal. What I would say is exciting and alluded to a little bit in our conversation is we've seen the landscape shift in the ocular space um, over the past few years to be more open to the possibility, and I would say this is really a scientist's point of view, um, that there might be recovery of function. We don't know yet for RP group one, and for many programs, we won't know until we get into clinical trial testing, to be completely honest. But there is a belief that there's a possibility that if there's some preserved photoreceptors, even that have lost function, but an intact photoreceptor that we may be able to re regain function. But this is an unknown until really we start clinical trials. Um, I think there's evidence from other clinical trials in different disorders, not related to RP group one, that have even shown, um, I, I, I guess I won't overstate it, but the exciting results beyond what we really thought was feasible probably two years ago. So I think this is gonna be a shifting landscape in a very positive way over the next few years. I think we're gonna to start to see other programs in a similar stage show and start to prove out that there might be more that we can do than we originally thought. And if you ask me, we solve, save everyone's vision and solve world peace. So no, <laughs> just kidding. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> All right. Um, so somebody did ask about the team page on the website and what it is, um, it will, we'll load it up onto our website starting later this month. And it, it is, uh, it's a shell and you draw, you will be able, each individual person will be able to drop in information about themselves or their family or the person that they're raising funds for. You could either put in a uh, photo or you could use one of our photos and it's just a portal if you will and you would send that out send the link for that out to other people um, and they would use that link to make a donation specifically to your to your page to your if you want to call it a team um, so it personalizes the message to the people as opposed to just that thermometer that we have that's going to the general RP Grip One project. It's a much more personal way to communicate with people that you know. And we'll definitely send out emails uh, our, and, and information in our next newsletter as well as post it on our social media um, and post it on our website when it's up and running. Heather, there was a question, how can attendees continue to collaborate on fundraising ideas after this call? Odelia Facebook group, question mark. That's a fantastic question. Um, we do not currently have an Odelia Facebook group, but I think the first step would be to shoot me an email and then we will uh, either, we'll find some way that we can connect people together. If that's through Facebook or through another, uh, online tool or we'll have other maybe Zooms together to just kind of generate some ideas and talk through things. Initially, um, sorry if you just mentioned it, Heather, I was just reading the chat. Initially, if people wanted to express interest, they should reach out to you. Yes, and my email is... Uh, if you can spell it out, that'd be it's great. It's H-G-R-E-E-N-E. Green has an E on the, at the end at odelia.org. Um, yes, 
the a question just came in about the LinkedIn profile. Yes, we will. We would love for that to happen. And to support that, we on this resources page, one of the ideas we have is to either have a graphic or a one pager or just a small um, different paragraphs that you can use to talk about Odelia, because it's really important um, for us to to share consistent messaging so that we're all uh, people can get a good understanding of, of, of what Odelia is trying to do for the, R, the RP Group One project. And so we will also put that information on the resource page that makes it easier for y'all to use um, in your whatever social media outlet you have. And somebody has mentioned the RP Group One family group page. Uh, so that, I guess it might be, Great to comment on what the difference is between the different social medias we're tapping into and how that differs. So that is, from what I understand, a closed family group, um, which is very common and would be separate from what we can tap into directly. We have had discussions about um, Odelia having a presence on Facebook. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's something we could consider if that's an easier route for communication. Uh, we also work with Melissa, who's on this phone call, to push announcements through that group to make sure it gets to as broad of an audience as we can. And I'm going to hopefully put the right link in. If, if folks want to know where to subscribe or see the webinar after this is recorded and posted, this should be the link. And I think that's visible to everyone. That should take you to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe. Um, we also post on social media through LinkedIn and Twitter, usually once those videos get up and get posted. Okay, we have five more minutes. Are there any other questions either through uh, Q&A, the chat, or feel free to raise your hand and if you wanna speak directly. Okay, um, I think that's all we have. If there's questions that come up, um, oh, okay, there's actually another comment on an LCA specific private group on Facebook, um, a general one, and the rpgroup1.com page that Melissa's mentioning. So lots of ways to connect. One question, um, any further info on your viral gene vector? So we, we utilize the ANC-80 capsid, which was discovered in Luke Vandenberg's lab. Um, we're excited about this capsid. It's, it has some unique characteristics that we think differ from some of the capsids. So when I say capsid, I'm talking about the AAV technology. It's kind of another interchangeable word we often use. Um, some of the characteristics we see that are unique to that capsid that we're excited about, uh, generally expression looks to be higher than what we've seen with other capsids that are commonly used, which often means we can use a decreased dose. Uh, we won't really land on the exact dosing that we would use in clinical trials until we finalize the safety study. So that's a portion of the next set of testing is really drilling down on proving safety as well as um, making a final decision on the dose to be used. Uh, the other thing is expression seems to come on a little bit earlier. Uh, so when we're talking about the RP group one portion, that's what we call the transgene. And generally with this ink 80 technology, we see the onset of expression of RP group one a little bit earlier than we do with other capsids. Now with a, a chronic disorder, that is not that critically important, but it is a unique characteristic for the program. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else significant about the vector, um, feel free to ask any questions, happy to talk about it. And as we mentioned before, feel free to reach out over the over email. Uh, you can email the info box with scientific questions, fundraising questions, ideas, um, and also feel free to support us through social media. It's another easy way just engaging on social media and reposting and sharing it helps kind of broaden the network that we can tap into. Anything else, Heather, that you can think of? 
you mentioned this, but just a reminder, this will be, the recording will be available and we'll send out a link afterwards as well. And so if that generates questions for anyone you know, or for you after you sit and, and think about things, please feel free to reach out. Uh, one more question on fundraising, Heather. Will the 1.9 million be broken down into smaller campaigns? I see the different funding sources. Wasn't sure if that would be something like a seasonal drive so people can rally around more immediate deadlines. Yes, yes. Um, we're, we, the short answer is yes. <laughs> we hope to launch that uh, on rare disease day, a small, a campaign for a, a little bit smaller amount because 1.9 is, is a big chunk. Um, and to be able to also explain what that goes for because um, some of the studies are a little bit larger uh, have a little bit larger price tag, but uh, yes, we'll do that. And we'll, that's one of the things I would also like to talk to, to volunteers about to see if there's a specific idea or, you know, thing that, that makes sense um, to, to do at a particular time of year. I've worked with a lot of rare disease communities in my past and every community is a little bit different. So I think one of the the ideas Heather has really focused on is putting together this volunteer group for their peer group one community and tapping into the resources, which can be incredibly varied from community to community. Um, so I, I think this is a great idea and a great path forward uh, for us to really understand the, the interest level, how best to utilize that interest um, and amplify it. So I really encourage if you have some time or if you have a skill set or uh, whatever it may be to reach out and, and we kind of brainstorm. I, I'm excited to see where that group goes. All right, I think with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you, everyone. I was gonna rerun that poll and I, I forgot, but we have run out of time. Um, but thank you guys for joining. We really appreciate your time today and stay in touch.